So welcome BIU particular library and thank you for coming. Thank you. And also thank you for our lovely audience for showing up and Athena Publishing and uh, Danish Embassy for helping to organize this, this event. Uh, you're here now because of your first Finnish translation, Murder of Hal Holland, yes. which published this, this autumn. But uh, you have a very long and distinguished literary career in Denmark before. Many uh, years, yes. <laughs> and many people probably don't know yet who we are you in no, Finland. No, I would think so. So maybe we could have a short, short introduction. To what to I've you. been doing yeah, all my right. life. Yeah, yes. Right. Um, shouldn't this work? Yeah. So you don't okay. have to yeah. do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you hear what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, well, I had my first book uh, published 25 years ago, and my first three books were collections of poetry. So I started off as a poet. And I also started off as a translator, actually. I translate uh, books from English into Danish. And later on, I started uh, translating Swedish books as well. And um, I have uh, actually been living as a writer and translator for 25 years. Before that, I had a lot of odd jobs, as many young people have. But I have. Uh, I haven't had a proper job since then. Um, uh, so I'm mainly a poet, but uh, I've written two collections of uh, short stories as well. And one other novel, which was published in 1990, which was also out in Sweden, actually, with Scott Van. Uh, but that's a long time ago. <laughs> and quite a different uh, novel from the new one. Okay. Are we, are we seeing now some, some sort of move from poetry to prose? Or? Well, I've, when I uh, when I had my first book out, I just had the feeling that now I was a writer, uh, and I didn't really realize that if you start off as a poet, then you are a poet. And when my first novel was published uh, five years later. Uh, the newspapers wrote that, uh, well, it was a fine novel, but of course it was easy to tell that I was a poet. And it wasn't meant in any bad way, but I was a bit uh, disappointed, really, because I thought now I had my first book out, and now the world was open, and I had plans to write all kinds of books. Uh, but, but as a poet, you're sort of something special, and that's fine by me, but... Um, Myself, I read mostly prose, so I thought I was going to write lots of novels, but until now, only two, and then two small novels uh, for children as well. And one was out in Sweden as well, Lied des New York. You can borrow this later. But so I, I, but I, I write more and more prose but I write poetry still. So now I do as I plan. I write all kinds of books. Uh, before we talk about your book, Mother of Holland, can you tell, tell <laughs> Should I tell few you words something about, about this book? Yes. Because we don't have it in Finnish, so no, it's it's, probably it's, it's in Danish and yeah. Swedish. Uh, well, I had to reread it last year because uh, my publisher made a paperback of it. And I had this feeling that this was written by some strange person that I didn't know. It's not that I'm not, uh, I'm okay with it, but it's, I was very young when I wrote it. And it's about a very young man who's in a war, and um, a civil war, a hundred or two hundred years ago. And he's wounded and brought to a, is it called a lazarette, or it's a, a place for the wounded, and a young woman takes care of him, and he falls in love with, falls in love with her. And uh, he uh, meets a man who's counting the days, he's counting down, because he knows that the sun will uh, stop. 
so there are so, so and so many days left to live in. It's like, it's not like a fairy tale, but maybe a bit uh, dreamlike and uh, not very realistic, but uh, it's told by a young man. And um, I did that because I've been uh, writing uh, poetry. And uh, some people said that I wrote erotic poetry, which made me very uh, uh, bashful, and I didn't think that they were right. And, and I had, uh, as a young person, uh, problems reading my poetry, knowing that people thought it was erotic. So I thought, um, now I'm going to write something about a young man, so they will know this has got nothing to do with me, which of course is wrong, because I wrote it. But still, it's, um, read it. It's a nice book written by some strange girl many years ago. Yeah. You think we'll be seeing that in finished translation? You can ask my publisher. <laughs> I wouldn't count on it. Well, we no. hope. Uh, your book, book Murder Holland, is now out in Finnish and it's available in bookstores and also in libraries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Some people might have read this in, in Swedish now. I yes. think there are people here, but uh, probably most of the people here haven't had a chance to read no. yet. No. So maybe you could also give, give a short introduction of yes. Hans Murdoch. Yeah. It's um, well, it's um, it's a book about a woman called Bess. She is a writer. And she lives with a man who's called Hella. Some people think that this is a book about some ecological catastrophe in Sweden, but it's not. Uh, Hella is a man. And um, he gets shot on page two, so I can reveal that. Reveal that. Um, uh, but it's not a crime fiction novel as such. It's. Uh, it's not a book about a murder. It's, it's a book about the widow of Helen and how she felt in the days after he was killed. That's very short of course. Um, uh, Bess is, uh, of course, grieving, but uh, a lot of people would say she's acting very strangely, maybe. But then again, I don't know if there are any rules for how you have to act when your husband has passed away. I think there are no rules, <laughs> and you wouldn't know uh, how you are going to react till you experience a catastrophe yourself. It doesn't have to be that someone is killed. It could be many other different things. You, you sometimes think that you know what you would do, but I'm quite sure you don't, because um, of course, some people know themselves very well, <laughs> but um, maybe not that well. Anyhow, she, she does a lot of strange things. And she used to be married to another man, and she had a daughter. And this daughter, <coughs> who was 14 at the time, chose not to see her mother anymore when she chose to live with Helen. And she's been living with him for 10 years. And uh, for all those years, she hasn't seen her daughter, who is now a grown-up woman. So this is one of the first thoughts she gets when he's, he's dead. Now I might be able to talk to my daughter again. That's one of the things that she, uh, that she thinks about. Uh, painter of the best uh, is a writer, you mentioned. Yes. Uh, is he seen anything that like autobiographical character of any but self portrait of the uh, Can we have any clues of your Well my <laughs> husband was not shot in the town square and um, uh, well there are similarities of course she's about the same age as I am and she um, she is a writer. But but then I think 
most of the similarities really stop there. Um, I think I might be a strange person, but I think perhaps Bess is a bit stranger than I am. I hope so, anyway. Um, but of course, we wouldn't know how she was, uh, how Bess really is, because we meet her at this point where her husband has died, so I would think that normally she's a bit more um, sort of just an ordinary person. More coherent. Yes, a more coherent person. But 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 she she is telling the story and she um, <clears throat> she doesn't try to hide that she actually prefers to be on her own. Which is quite normal for writers. I think you have to be on your own to work and you have to be on your own to read and you have to be on your own to think. And she doesn't really like people. Um, I do for instance, but she doesn't. So uh, she's very much alone, even though she lives in this uh, town. Um, I'm, a, I'm a librarian. And, yes. You know, we like classifying things and yes. putting them in there. Yeah, where you did know, you put it? Well, that's, a, that's something I was going to ask, <laughs> ask you, because yeah. some libraries put it on the crime fiction, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, murder mysteries, and that's all. But obviously there's many elements that don't really fit that genre. No. And there are some, uh, well, there's a murder, there's a mystery, yes. some kind of. Yeah. So, well. how would you classify it? Uh, well, you, if you have more than one copy, you could put them <laughs> in different places. I would prefer that. <coughs> I know that some bookshops in Denmark put some on the crime fiction shelf and some with the more ordinary fiction. I didn't mean this to be crime fiction, actually. Uh, I mean, there was no genre uh, put on, my, on the Danish, uh, uh, the Danish novel. It just said, this is a novel. But of course, if you call a book The Murder of Helen, you sort of, uh, I didn't do this to capture crime fiction readers. I just did it because I thought it was funny. And I thought that uh, if people knew the other books I had been writing, they would know that it wouldn't be crime fiction. But there, of course, I made a mistake because a lot of more people read novels and people who have read this book didn't know anything about me because they didn't read short stories and they didn't read poetry, so they just thought it was crime fiction. So I have met a lot of quite angry people around in Denmark who thought it was crime fiction. But I've also met people who uh, thought it was crime fiction and was happy anyway. Because it is a sort of crime fiction novel. It's just that there isn't the um, ordinary solution where the, the detective gathers around people at the library. She goes to the library, but there's no solution. And, uh, the, Except for my publisher and me, the first person who wrote, uh, who read this book, she was a proofreader. And when I talked to her, I was of course very curious to know what she think, thought about it. And I said, well, are you angry with me now? And she said, why should I be angry? And I said, well, I didn't tell you who the murderer was. And then she said, well, I know who killed him. And I was very happy with that and I thought, well, now, Everything's going to be okay. But of course, not every. Some people want me to tell them, and I can say to you that I wouldn't do that. So don't ask for that. Yeah. <coughs> if you don't mind, I'll continue a bit with this crime fiction mm -hmm. team. Dark and Snow had wrote about murder of Palm as follows. Uh, just as Umberto echoes the name of the rose, make crime fiction of her intellectual. So does Pia use murder of Holland dismantle the rules of an entire genre. Mm. How, do you, how do you feel with this assessment? Well, I think it's a bit too grand, really, because it's just a novel. What I actually wanted to do, if I could tell you that, <coughs> I'm sorry, is that I read a lot of crime fiction myself, loads of it, and I think that many, many crime fiction novels are awfully poorly written. I have to admit that. 
Some of them are quite good. But I read most of them with great pleasure because I want to uh, be entertained and I want to be thrilled. And I like, even though some crime fiction books are, are not very, haven't got a beautiful language or anything like that, they are very good at what they should be good at. Uh, to uh, get you excited and want to read on. And I like that. But when I've been reading all these crime fiction novels, I've often thought about this, that uh, the minor characters of these books, uh, The Witness, for instance, you all know, if you read crime fiction, you know this opening. A man is walking his dog in the morning, and the dog is, starts to bark and stumbles across a body. And the man, of course, has to call the police, and the police arrives, and then you very often hear nothing more about this wretched poor man who found a body. And I thought, someone should write a novel about him. And I am writing about him at the moment, another novel. But another minor character is the bereaved, the widow or the widower, or people who lost someone. Thank you. <laughs> now I won't cough anymore. Um, so, you, you hear something about uh, the family who lost someone, <clears throat> and then um, if they are not suspects, you never hear about them again. And I've been thinking about them very often as well. Thinking, well, her husband was shot. What is he going through? I, I, so I wanted to write some novels that were in the outskirts of the ordinary crime fiction novel. That was my plan. Uh, Built in the same way that today they do history, uh, history of the novel, forgotten people, or yes. small people. Yeah, anything that's uh, sort of forgotten, yes. Yeah, there are also some direct references to crime stories in the book. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, Bass is watching a crime series from television that yes. he concludes that they are nothing like real life, but that some, something like crime stories are descriptive and they seem more true than real life. It's still un unreal and confusing and difficult to understand. Them. Mm -hmm. From that point of view, to make a huge, huge generaliz generalization, I would say that. Uh, Traditional crime fiction is kind of uh, rationalist, positivist mm. in, in its philosophy. Yes. And uh, Murdoch Pallet has been described in some places as an existential mm -hmm. crime fiction. Yeah. How do you well, think I about don't that? know about that really. I mean, it might be true, but. Um, I, I didn't mean to write something that was, for instance, more realistic. But, but, but of course, anything concerning a murder is different. And by that I mean that if someone is killed on one of the first pages, everything you read after that will be loaded with this. So if I introduce another character, people will think, that's a killer. And, and that makes the whole difference to the novel. So I couldn't just, he could be, he could have been hit by a car and died. But that would have been a completely different story. It, it, it matters a lot. I mean, some very, um, some of the French uh, new novels were quite boring. They were boiling water. They were looking out the window. Nothing happened and you fell asleep. I did, anyway. But imagine that you know, like in the Hitchcock movies, you know a man gets, he comes home to his apartment, he goes to boil some water, but we know that behind the door is a man. And then watch him boiling the water. Whoa! Then it's all of a sudden, it's different, and it's very exciting. I don't, I don't mean to say that you have to introduce a murder or a killer to, to write thrilling prose, but I just, I like this, what it gives, what it brings to the novel. That's what I can tell you. Uh, about the style of your writing, I have a quotation from a, a blogger mm -hmm. called Victoria Berg. 
was a victorious book, so look, and there's a, there's a comment. Okay. She says that every person in this book is a reader to tempt themselves into each other. As a reader, I expect the words to make up stories, and in that sense, this book is a riddle as well, because you somehow managed to write an anti story. An anti story? Uh, anti. Anti story, yes. Well. Perhaps. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, except it sounds nice. <laughs> okay, I can give you the full, full text later. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. She's, she's also one who talked about this existential oh, yes. murder yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Another reading that uh, I was kind of finding there is kind of a feminist reading. Oh, <laughs> yes. Because, uh, but you would you know, describe this kind of feminist murder mystery, maybe. Yes. The, the main character seems to be quite occupied with these uh, social conventions and mm. kind of uh, social restrictions. What yes. woman is supposed to do and what's allowed and mm. is it okay, like going to drinking mm. week after your husband yeah. is murdered. And, uh, yeah. It's also mentioned that uh, he's left, he left, her, left her husband and uh, mm. her child Abby, mm. who never kind of accepted them. Yeah. And that's also a big social taboo, I think, yes. in Finland and maybe in Denmark mm. also. The, Women really are not supposed to leave their, leave their children, children no, whereas it's not. somehow more accept acceptable if uh, men do it. Yes. Well, I wouldn't agree on that, but anyway. Well, um, it's true what you say, that, that these things, conventions, um, she's breaking some conventions. But I, and this is really honestly, I have never thought that she's breaking some female conventions. I have just thought that a lot of the things she does is uh, morally suspect in a society. But I have never thought that it just accounted for the fact that she was a woman. I mean, if a man uh, went to the pub the night after his uh, wife was uh, buried, as she does, and gets very drunk, I would think that people would be a bit uh, put off by that as well. But now when I think of it, maybe they would think, just think, well, he needs to, of course, he's sad, he needs to drink. You might be right, but I have never thought about it in that way. And uh, I would think that if a man left his wife and kid and the kid said, I won't see you again, that would be the same problem, really. Because Bess uh, doesn't actually leave her daughter. She leaves her husband, and she thinks that she's going to have her daughter still, but then the daughter decides that she doesn't want to see her mother, and that's an enormous difference. Um, she didn't count on that, she didn't imagine that would happen, but it happened. Yep, yeah, I was thinking it was kind of a, even kind of a yes, yes. kind of a trick, and you know, maybe something that she kind of in a Freudian sense, wanted to have her husband or yeah. husband murdered so that he, she could kind of uh, recreate yes. her yes. relationship yes. with her daughter. Yes. But this, uh, I mean, um, I can answer that because it's not like the solution to what whoever killed him. But you can also co uh, talk about the murder of Helen in, a, in another way than the actual killing because uh, she, uh, Bess actually herself talks about this, that she might have killed him before he was actually shot. <laughs> because even though this is the great love, at least for the first year that they're together, they actually don't communicate very much. And she says, I think perhaps Helen would have loved to get to know me, <laughs> but I didn't let him. And it turns out that there are lots of things about him that she didn't know and they have been together for 10 years. So in some other sense, you could say she killed him or their love has died or something like that. So it's not just this, and it, you could say as well that since this is the first thing she thinks when he die, dies, now I can call my daughter. It's of course maybe not that she has shot him, but maybe that she sometimes 
have been wishing him maybe not dead, but just not there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for our audience and Athena Publishing and the Danish Embassy and the Korea Library staff for everything. Thank you. Thank you.